What's up, Ify Bio Penguins? It's Friday, so guess what? FRQ Friday, FRQ Friday. Yeah, there's only two more weeks you have to deal with this, like, because the AP exam is in two weeks from today, so you don't have to deal with my drama any much longer. It's great. Um, so today we're going to do three different short free response questions. Uh, so the three that we're going to do, um, we're going to do 2018 number five, 2017 number four, and 2016 number three. So five, four, three. And then, of course, there's two weeks till the exam, so two, one. I don't know. I was just trying to be funny there. Um, so we are in ecology, which means that these are both going to be, F or all three of these will be ecological type questions. So um, some birds, including the great spotted cuckoos, lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, such as the reed warblers. The warbler parents raise the unrelated chicks and provide them with food that would otherwise be given to the biological offspring. A researcher conducted an investigation to determine the type of relationship between the warblers and the cuckoos in an environment without predators. The researcher found that nests um, containing only warblers were more likely to be successful than nests containing warblers and cuckoos. Data not shown... Um, a successful ne nest is defined as a nest where at least one chick becomes an adult warbler. In some geographic areas, several species of the nest's predators are present. Um, researchers have found that cuckoo chicks, while in the nest, produce a smelly substance that deters nest pr predators. The substance not, does not remain in the nest if the cuckoo chicks are removed, so figure one shows probability that the nest containing only warblers or containing both warblers and cuckoos will be successful in an environment. And then in a follow-up, they then added the cuckoos to a nest with only warblers, and they removed cuckoos from the nest without warblers, and they were testing to see what was going to happen, right? So the first question we have is describe the symbiotic relationship that exists between a cuckoo and a warbler. Now, it did give you a whole bunch of information, right? And so, as always, we want to underline this up. That's important. It kind of helps jog our memory and makes us so that we'll be able to do things later, right? So, the cuckoos are going to lay their eggs in the nest of the warbler. The warbler then raises those cuckoos and provides them with food that should be going to the actual warbler's kids. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You telling me that the cuckoo bird just stole the food from the warbler? Whoa. So what kind of relationship would we be talking about, right? Because the cuckoo is benefiting because it's getting all this food, right? While the warbler is negatively impacted because of the fact that it should be giving food to its own young, but instead it's feeding the cuckoo bird. So what kind of relationship do we know of is a positive for one and a negative for the other in which one of them is harming the other? That would be a parasite. Okay, so you've talked about that the cuckoos are parasites of the warbler. You could also just describe it, right, and say that the cuckoo is going to, great job, uh, gift, um, it's parasitic. Uh, the cuckoo benefits from relationship and the warbler is harmed because it does say describe, right? So at no point does it say that I actually have to identify them as parasites. We just had to describe. So all you had to do was say that the cuckoo was going to benefit because of the fact that it's getting that food while the warbler is being harmed because it should be feeding its own young. I hope that makes sense. So the second part of this question, on the template provided, draw bars in the appropriate locations to predict the relative probability. FYI, this is kind of like what you might see for question five, right? Because we're going to draw something. It's not a full on graph, but we're just modifying, making a prediction of some type, okay? So this could be what you see for question five um, in terms of a draw type situation. Um, so, it says that if we're looking at, they have parasites and could kill the animals. Oh, they also have parasites, I guess. Um, so, the cuckoos were added to the nest containing only warblers. So, if I added cuckoos here, right, what do we expect to happen? Well, they did tell us that my cuckoos were going to produce a smelly substance that would deter any type of predator. So, if there's a predator present, right, then would that be more successful or less successful than the warblers already are? Right? Well, because of the fact that the cuckoos are going to deter and cause those predators not to come, we would expect the overall success to be higher. Because of the fact that the cuckoos, although they're getting food, um, they're causing the predators not to come to that area, so we would actually see overall success. Now, it does also say that the substance does not remain if the cuckoo is removed. Here, I take the cuckoos out, right? So I took the cuckoo out of the nest. What do I expect to happen? 
Well, we no longer are stopping the predators from coming to the area, so I would expect there to be a lower amount. Okay. Now these were not accurate numbers. This is literally just as long as you had it above. Sorry, my about my son. Um, as long as you had this bar above this bar, you're good. And as long as you had this bar below this bar, you were good. Okay. So there we got that. And so now we have to figure out. Okay. Well, what kind of symbiotic relationship is this, right? Because the warbler is giving food to the young for the cuckoo, right? And the cuckoo is deterring any type of predator from coming to the area. Well, now they're both benefiting, right? So what kind of relationship do we see in which both parties are going to benefit from the situation? I'm hoping you all are currently screaming in your head, mutualism. Um, so you would say that we have mutualism or you would say that both organisms are going to benefit. So. That was not too bad of a question, right? It was nice and easy, three-pointer, one point for each part. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, um, the new questions that we're going to see this year, like always, um, they're going to be, for the short FRQ, part A, part B, part C, and part D are each going to be worth one point. So you know exactly where all your points are. And so if you happen to skip around and you skip part C, you know that you need to go back to part C, okay? If you're on like uh, question one or two, you want to give yourself a little checklist because they're going to have multiple action verbs. Um, and so those parts can be worth more than one point per part, okay? Um, so the next one we have is a food chain or food web. Sorry, it's food web. A table above or actually now is below shows how much each organism in an ecosystem relies on various food sources. The rows represent the organisms in an ecosystem and the columns represent the food source. The percentages indicate the proportional dietary composition of each organism. High percentages indicate strong dependence of an organism on a food source. Okay, so here we can kind of see the different organisms and then the percent of their diet that's made up of these different organisms. So here you see like midges, 100% is the algae. Here you see the canis fly, 70% is algae, 30% is midges. And so you can kind of get the idea that these percentages are how much these organisms organisms are eating okay so we're given this beautiful web and this is another example of something you might see for number five in which they're just asking you to label a diagram um, so based on the food sources indicated in the table construct a food web in the template below yes there's a template given write the organism names on the appropriate lines and draw arrows necessary to indicate energy flow between organisms who that's a lot but i do okay so let's think for a second i see there's something right is going straight to the midges. And then the midges are branching out to three different organisms, okay? So if I look over here and I look at my midges, right? There are three different things that eat it, right? So the stonefly eats it. The, what is that? The hell grand mites eat it. And then the caddis fly also eats it, right? What's the only thing that doesn't eat it? Well, the midges, are, of course, are not going to eat each themselves. We are going to see the algae, right? So the algae is the only thing that, of course, isn't consuming anything, right? So we know that that's going to be our producer. You also could look and say, okay, well, the algae, 100% of that algae is being eaten by the midges. So that can tell me that, hey, that bottom one should be algae, okay? And students, for some reason, sometimes have trouble with these arrows, okay? So I like to think about the arrowhead like a mouth, right? So wherever you see the arrowhead, it's eating the organism below it, right? So here we had this midge, right? And it's got the open mouth and it's going to be eating the algae, right? So the midge eats the algae, as we see in our beautiful chart, okay? So of course, what is going to eat the midges and the algae? So if I look over here, what consumes both midges and algae? Well, that would be my canis fly. My canis fly is gonna consume both the midges and the algae. So go ahead and put that onto my uh, food web, right? And because of the fact that it's eating the algae, I need to go ahead and draw that arrow to show that the energy is coming from the algae to the canis fly, right? So we're gonna do the exact same thing now. And I'm gonna say, okay, well, what can consume the midges and the canis fly? So we see, okay, well, here's my midges. They're being eaten by the stoneflies and they're being eaten by the, okay. And then this is here we see, oh, what is happening? But look, this eats the stoneflies. So I know that that one can't be it. So I go ahead and I say, okay, well, the stoneflies must be next because they only eat midges and the canis flies. So go ahead and fill that in. And go ahead and draw my arrow to say, okay, the canis flies, I'm sorry, the stoneflies are eating the canis flies. And the only thing left would be, of course, be this hell grammets, whatever those things are. 
that are going to eat both the stone flies, the midges, and the candice flies, right? So this is where students had the issue in terms of their arrows, okay? They weren't connecting the fact that candice flies were also being consumed by the hell granites, okay? So you got to make sure that you understand all of that components, okay? So that was our beautiful constructed food web. I believe that this was worth maybe two points. I think this was worth two points. Um, the first point for, I believe, labeling everything, and the second point where we we're drawing all the arrows. So now they want to say, okay, well, an effort to control the number of midges in an area within an ecosystem was sprayed with a fungus, which significantly decreased the mid population. Based on the data in the table, predict whether the spraying of the fungus will have the greatest short-term impact on the population of the stoneflies, the candy flies, or the hell grammets, and then justify your prediction. So I need to figure out, okay, if there is no more midges available, which organism is going to be most effective? Which organism is going to have the worst time because it lost its food source, right? So you now have to use those percentages that we saw on the chart, right? So if I look here at the midges, right, I have a 90%, a 10, and a 30%. If I look, the 90% corresponds to stoneflies. So 90% of the stonefly diet is the midges, right? 10% of the hell grammets um, food, uh, diet is the midges, and then 30% of the candice flies diet is the midges. So which one is going to be most affected by losing the midges from the population or from the community, I mean? That would, of course, be our stonefly, right? Because the fact that the stoneflies have 90% of their food source is now gone. So that is your explanation. You could have said that midges are 90%, 30% uh, is candice fly, 10% is hell grammets. And then you also could have said that there was just a higher dependence on the midges um, than the hell grammets. So I hope that was helpful. I'm not seeing any questions popping in the chat. I think y'all are doing okay. Remember, if you have a question, you're more welcome to drop in the chat. I should be able to see it. Um, although there was a quick conversation that happened in there earlier that I missed the whole thing. That's okay. Hey, okay, so... As last question, I'm going to tell you right now. Sometimes you see graphs and you look at these graphs and you go, what the heck is that wanting me to do? And this is an example of one of those graphs, okay? Specifically, the reader, I'm sorry, the readers, the uh, item writers are coming up with things that are going to cause you to actually show that you understand what's going on, right? So they'll change the names of things, especially this year with the digital exam. They're going to um, modify graphs. They're going to make it so that you don't, you can't rely on your previous knowledge of doing a lab or previous knowledge of doing an activity. They are going to modify it in a way that you won't have your prior knowledge and you're going to have to apply whatever you do know. Okay, so don't get freaked out if you see a graph or you hear about an organism that you've never heard about before because they're doing that to try to ensure they know the biology, not that you did some activity and you can remember what happened in the activity, okay? So our graph above, illustrates the percent dry weight, which actually is below, um, of different parts of particular annual plants, the plants that live less than one year, from early May to late August. The percent dry weight can be used to estimate the amount of energy a plant uses to produce its leaves, vegetative buds, stems, roots, and reproductive parts. No, you can't be part of my life. Um, okay, so looking at this graph, we can kind of see that here's the percent that it's taken up. So, you know, germination, 100% is in the roots, right? And as we move on, we kind of see that we make more of the leaves, and then we start kind of making the seeds at the end of its kind of its time because it now needs to take these seeds and, of course, um, plant them so that it would be able to grow a new uh, plant next year, okay? So identify the direct source of energy used for plant growth during the first week of May, and then identify the part of the plant that grew the most during that same period. So we're looking right here, okay? So let's think for a second. You need to grow a plant. What are you going to put into the ground to grow said plant? Think for a second. I know you know this. What did you put down into the ground so that you would get a new tomato plant or a new something? You put a seed in the ground, didn't you? I think you did. And so how does this plant now grow? How does it get the energy? Because it's underground. It's not like it has a leaf that can photosynthesize, right? So how does it get energy? Well, the seed. 
The seed has stored energy. It has organic materials that are stored in it. It's called the endosperm. And it is this component that is just made of organic molecules that are going to provide the energy for it. So when they ask, well, where is the energy coming from? It's coming from the seed, or you can say the stored organic materials, right? And I need to identify the part of the plant that grew the most. Um, do you not see 100% of something? That 100% is this little brown thing, right? And that corresponds to the roots. So all you had to do was use a little bit of logic and go, okay, seed is what grows. The food is in the seed. That's why we eat seeds, right? If you ever think about you eat sunflower seeds, you eat peas, you're eating all these seeds, right? Well, there's food in them. Actually, pea is a fruit. Sorry, I was wrong. You get the idea, though. The, the, you know, I think you know that the seed. Okay, hopefully you do know that. Anyways, um, so based on the data of the graph, estimate the percent of total energy that the plant has allocated to the growth of leaves, right? So if I look at, where were they at? July. So here's July, right? And this little part I've, I've kind of identified is where the leaves are, right? So if I look over here, I say, okay, well, here's 100%, here's 50%. So that must be like 50%. So they got an answer between 45 and 55%. You're good. All you had to do was read the graph. I believe in you. You could do this. And the last but not least, now we got to bring a little bit of evolution into this, right? We got to think logically. We got to apply some biology, okay? So compare with periantals. The plants that live more than two years, annual plants often allocate a much greater percentage of their total energy um, to growth of their reproductive parts in any given year. Propose one evolutionary advantage of the energy allocation strategy in annual plants compared with that of periantal plants. Okay, so why do these plants? Um, why do these plants oftentimes put more energy into their reproductive parts? thinking about that they reproduce every single year. And if they don't reproduce every year, they don't survive. Hmm. Well, logically, because of the fact that if they don't use that strategy, they're probably not going to reproduce, right? Because they need to be able to have those reproductive parts to be able to make those seeds in order to grow and divide. Not grow and divide, but to make new plants, right? And then also, it increases their probability of reproducing before they die since they only live for one year. Okay, so the two options you could have put, the increased chance of reproduction, or you could have said that the plants do not use the, that do not use the strategy, decrease their likelihood of being able to reproduce. Um, so next week, we will do um, these four FRQs. I don't know what I was thinking when I designed this, but that will be our last FRQ Friday, okay, because your AP exam is two weeks from today two weeks from today you have 14 days well technically 13 days because the day's almost over you have 13 days you can do this um and so next week will be our last frq friday um because of course i can't do an frq friday after you've taken the test um and then a quick reminder that I want you to download your AP exam app. So if you haven't downloaded your app, you need to make sure you download your exam app. Um, and then there was a question in the chat, so I want to make sure I answer that. Uh, the person said, um, do you have any tips of whether to watch AP Daily videos more or to read the textbook? Um, honestly, at this point, you need to figure out where your weaknesses are. Okay, um, So you can either take the 2013 practice exam that is open access, just search on Google AP Bio practice exam, and it should pull up from AP Central, the 2013 exam. I um, just got in trouble from College Board because I posted it for y'all. So you have to actually go to their website to pull it. I'm sorry, I tried to save you a step, but it didn't work. Um, so you can go and download that and find where your weaknesses are. Um, if your teacher has given you a practice exam, ask them to analyze your test. Um, I have posted a beautiful data analysis tool for your teachers in the Facebook group. So I'm assuming you came to me because your teacher told you to come to me. Um, and so they have access to that Excel file and they can analyze your practice exam and tell you where your strengths and weaknesses are. So back to what I was saying. So find out what your weaknesses are and then work on your weaknesses. 
okay? Your strengths are already strength. You're already gonna rock that part, right? It's your weaknesses that are where you're gonna find your misconceptions. Um, so if you're a video person, then go watch the topic videos on whatever topic it is that you're weak in, right? If you're a, um, like a hands-on person, um, you're probably gonna go to your textbook, maybe read and take like beautiful kind of either like uh, diagram notes or kind of make sketch notes and draw pictures, um, something that kind of really creatively gets the information so that you can see it in that way. Um, if you're just an auditory person and you just like to listen to something, you can download podcasts. Um, the Absolute Recap has a great podcast for biology. You can just download it, put it in your ear and go for a walk, you know, walk that dog, get those endorphins going, all that fun stuff. Um, and so then of course, doing practice problems also is helpful. So, um, uh, I believe you should be able to get to the performance, I'm sorry, the progress performance checks, per, performance progress checks, whatever those PPCs are. Um, and you can do some practice problems there. Um, I have all of my um, stories are saved. So you're easily able to go and look through the story and kind of see if you can answer those questions. I believe now it might show you all the answers, but still answers will still help you out. Um, you can go to the monster beast guide and find that unit and go through those practice questions and kind of work on the I can statements. Can you do everything that's in those I can statements? If you can't, then you need to figure out what you're, what you need to be able to do to do those. Um, so that, and again, last thing, don't overwhelm yourself, right? You have two weeks, do your best. Your best is always enough. No one in this entire world is going to be upset with you. If you did your best, your best will always be enough. You cannot do better than your best because your best is always enough. Okay. And even if your best isn't a passing score, that's okay. Because when you go to college, you will have already a foundation and it will make that college class so much easier. Right? So do not worry about your score. Again, it is one day. It is one test. It doesn't define you. It doesn't change who you are. It doesn't change all the biology that you learned this year. Okay. So do not, do not let the fact that the AP exam in two weeks really cause you any type of panic, right? Do what you can do, do your best, study. Some of you have more than one exam to prepare for and bio is actually the last one, okay? Um, so just kind of divide your time easily, you've got this. Um, and I believe in you, remember your penguins. Um, taking the exam in June, we still have three years to Okay, that's fine. Uh, I see. Thank you so much. Have an amazing day. Okay. Um, the person who said that they still have three units left, I'm assuming that those units are evolution and ecology. If they are, ecology is, in my opinion, what students do the best on because it's logical. You learned it in middle school. A lot of it, come on, predator prey, mutualism, where's the food going? You can kind of figure a lot of that out. Okay. Um, but you just do your best. It's okay if your teacher hasn't done it. You can either, you know, take it on yourself to look over that information on your own, pull up the CD, read through those sections, um, watch any of the, the lives that we've done. It's perfectly fine. And you know what? I've had students who on the first day of school, um, taking just the multiple portion can make a three on the exam. So as long as you can read and analyze, you might still be able to do well, even with those only teaching, uh, learning five units. Whoa. Okay. So. I hope y'all have a wonderful day. Um, and you remember, you are penguins and you are dressed for success. Bye, y'all.